when sociologists think about individuals, they do not think about personality or about uh, the mind. They think about what is something called the self. The self is a little bit different than what psychologists talk about because it's really considered um, a social thing, a presentation, if you will, of who you are. When, um, when we also think about the self in terms of um, how we group people. So I want to go over some terms to, see, to show you what the difference is in the way that we talk about groups of people and study people and study human interaction. So the first thing that term you should know is an aggregation. An aggregation is a collection of data about more than one person. So there are people who have things in common, um, for instance, female or a particular race or people born in Indiana or people under the age of 30. Um, they have this in common, but they may or may not know each other. They certainly don't think about each other as a group, and yet collecting data on them as an aggregation can help us see patterns uh, that become important in studying people in, and in their society. And this should be uh, contrasted to something called a group category. So this group category is more than just an aggregation. It is um, people who have some understanding of who is in what group. So it's not just a bunch of people that we're collecting data on and then we see after we've collected the data what they may or may not have in common, but rather we are essentially uh, picking a group of people because they are defined as a group of people. And then when we look at that, then we study them as a group of people. Now, this does not require that group of people to think of themselves as being a member of that group. So, um, for instance, most people in our society don't think of themselves as being a member of a particular social class or socioeconomic class. Um, you know, sometimes people think of themselves as working class or middle class but they really are not uh, identifying with that and they certainly don't have meetings of the middle class or you know, get togethers or whatever, but it's still a good category to study and it still is a category that has uh, a specific kind of understanding of who is in which group. Um, the uh, United States government has some very strict definitions on how to determine what socioeconomic level you're at or your household is at. So we want to uh, distinguish this more by saying that there are some groups which have affiliation. Now this is where you start having a kind of consciousness of belonging to a group uh, where people, for instance, uh, your classroom or this course is a group of people who have affiliated with each other by means of essentially um, joining the class, signing up for the class, enrolling in the class. So if I say to you, you're a social 101 class with a certain section number, you know who you are because you have formally joined that section. And so you still are a group category, but now you have some understanding of belonging to that class. And then the last um, of these is, when, is something called categoric knowing. And that categoric knowing means that this particular group affiliation that you have or category that you belong in is something that's very important to you. Um, for instance, a lot of people, um, gender is very important to them. They look in the mirror in the morning to make sure that they don't look too butch or don't look too feminine. You know, there's, there's a sense of uh, belonging to a particular gender as um, being important to your sense of self. Uh, you are both, you know, you know you're in that group and that group is important to you to be in and you think about who you are in relationship to that group. So there are some categories that you know you belong to, but you really don't 
uh, identify with them. They don't become a part of how you think about yourself. And so they just are a group affiliation that you have, but they are not necessarily that, that, um, that ultimate sense of, I am a member of this group. So we want to keep in, the reason I bring those uh, groups to mind or that idea of how we think about things um, is because we want to talk about two ideas here in this lecture. One is how people age, and the other, which is closely related, is how people do family. And of course, aging and family are connected with each other in part because we tend to think of particular familial relationships as being important at particular stages within our lives. And of course, this is culturally bound and can differ from culture to culture, but it is still a concept that is often linked uh, in our minds and also within sociological studies. So we want to talk about something called the aging life cycle. And I want to put a little caveat here. In the past, we've talked about this, sociologists meaning we, have talked about this in a very uh, sort of strict way, like you have a certain stage of life that you go through and then you transition to the next stage of life and everybody does it around the same age and does it pretty much in the same way. Well, we now recognize that that's sort of ethnocentric on the part of sociologists from the West, that how people age differs from culture to culture and also differs from generation to generation and even from individual to individual within those categories. So I want to talk about this in terms of these different stages, but I want you to think that this does not necessarily, one does not necessarily have to come after the other, and that the way we talk about this is more a, a group category rather than, you know, a, a kind of um, categoric knowing on the part of the person who's doing the aging. So anytime we talk about aging, one of the things we talk about is when people are born and they have our membership in a certain kind of age cohort. Age cohorts are important, and you probably know them better than you think you do, because if you have heard the term millennial or baby boomer, then you know what an age cohort is, because it's essentially people born within a particular uh, time period who, is the, who go through things within um, the history of their world around them that kind of hit the same historical event at the same time. In fact, age cohorts are interesting in terms of the sociological imagination because it is a way that we often connect to the bigger picture. To, you know, the sociological imagination is connecting your biography to history, and age cohorts are connecting your time of birth to the ways that you experience historical events. Um, for instance, baby boomers all know where they were when JFK was shot, and millennials all know where they were at 9-11. And, you know, so there's a kind of um, joint, we experience this part of history at the same stage in our lives, which can, you know, define a generation. And we have to be careful about this, though, because essentially people born around the same time can still experience life very differently depending upon what socioeconomic class they're in, depending upon what their nationality and racial backgrounds are, depending upon whether they're men or women or other genders or uh, have different sexual orientations, et cetera, et cetera. So age cohorts is a, is a nice little category to think about but we don't want to impose too much on that category uh, when we're talking about people who are part of it. Um, the other thing about it, before I go on to childhood, um, the other thing I want to just mention very quickly about age cohorts is that studying things with uh, looking at the cohort as part of the study can sometimes show that things are changing. If older generations are still experiencing something like, for instance, a wage gap that younger generations are not experiencing, then that can tell you that things may be beginning to change. So sociologists still use cohorts 
uh, in a lot of their studies just because it's a good idea to check and see if there's a pattern based upon aging that is emerging that might give them a hint as to what's going to happen in the future. Now, when sociologists talk about childhood as opposed to psychologists, we're not uh, necessarily considering, you know, like childhood development. And I mean, we talk about socialization and we're interested in how children sort of take on the social norms of their world. But really, another way that sociologists think about childhood is exactly how we define childhood. And that, believe it or not, changes depending upon the historic period you're in, depending upon uh, what subgroup you're in, what subculture you're in, and also depending upon um, what, uh, where you were born and what culture you're in. Um, we've had a lot of changes in what we think about childhood in the last 150 or so years. Uh, for one thing, we have far less children per parents than we used to. And ironically, when you have fewer children, um, two things happen. One is that you think a lot more about the need to have a child. And second, that child becomes more important within the family. Um, if you had told people in the 1850s that you're worried about whether you could afford a child or not, they would look at you like you're crazy because the way that they kept the family going, the way they kept the family business going or the farm or whatever, was to have a lot of children. Children were economic assets. They were um, what helped uh, feed everybody and help perpetuate um, the family wealth and so forth. Um, so you wouldn't think about them as having cost you anything because they were an investment and an asset that made the family survive, helped the family survive. Um, but on the other hand, because they had so many of them and because we have so few now, there was not a lot of rhetoric around how to make their childhood better or treat them as somebody special. And uh, there was a lot more um, uh, teach them what the rules are, teach them how to work hard, get them out in the field as soon as possible uh, kind of attitude where nowadays we worry about psychological development and we have self-help books to help us with parenting, we worry about the impact on them and so forth. And children are much more precious uh, in the way that we construct them than we used to. Um, this... Uh, has created an entire industry, but it's also sort of made us extend childhood to a certain extent. Like we now require children to go to school until age 16, where it used to be, you know, just through sixth grade. And we also, um, well, we've extended childhood all the way out to age 26 now because you can still stay on your parents' insurance all the way to age 26. So you know, when you become an adult, it becomes difficult to define because there are things you can do when you're 16, there are things you can do when you're 18, there are things that you can do when you're 21, there are things that you can do when you're 24, and so forth. And all of these things keep you connected to your parents. Um, so making the end of childhood much later in life. Um, and this is not true in every society. This is different. Uh, even within Western and European societies, this is a different thing. America, the United States probably has one of the longest childhoods um, on earth. Um, most cultures and most places, children take on adult responsibilities much earlier than they do in the United States. And we also have this thing called adolescence, which you may think was, you know, I mean, teenagers are people who are between the ages of 13 and 20. So hasn't there always been adolescence? And the answer is no. It's really a 20th century invention in which the idea of the teenager as an important period in life became uh, more prevalent. And even in, probably might even argue that it didn't really come into um, to its full acceptance until the 1950s when we have uh, the, the um, Bobby Soxers who, you know, are in all the teen angst movies and all of that kind of stuff. 
and rock and roll and music and um, uh, other kinds of commodities that are aimed at adolescents. Um, so we have this idea of the adolescent, and of course what goes with this is also definitions of when somebody commits a crime, if they commit a crime below, before they're 16, 17, or 18 years old, then you know this is considered um, a time period when you're less responsible for what you do than when you're older and become an adult. Um, so adolescence is a is a new con fairly new concept, and it has brought with it a lot of new ideas and norms around what growing up means. And of course, the next cycle stage would be adulthood, and there are lots of ways in which every culture has sort of a rite of passage to adulthood. And um, like I said before, we have several that start, you know, at age 16 and work their way all up to age 26. So you might suggest that um, in most of mainstream culture here, when you marry and when you have children, is your entrance into adulthood. So that can happen at different ages for different people. And this is why there's a lot of debate around teenage pregnancies and around, um, you know, allowing what the age of marriage and all of that kind of stuff because there are different ideas about when the normative time is to, um, to reach adulthood. And of course, adulthood comes with, you know, personal responsibility and the idea that you're going to financially support yourself. And of course, this can be quite difficult in some families and among some people, depending upon uh, circumstances. So we do have, and, and of course, we have this new thing now where uh, in social media, where people talk about having to take care of things as adulting. And um, adulting is sort of a, a new idea of looking at what it's like to be grown up. Um, and, and these kind of trends are changing the way that people think about what is a child, what is an adolescent, what is an adult. Um, of course, when we talk about adulthood, we often very much talk about what are you going to do when you grow up, what, meaning what kind of job are you going to take, what kind of career are you going to pursue. And um, Usually when we talk about that, people don't say, you know, well, when I grow up, I'm going to be a factory worker, or I'm going to be a garbage man, or I'm going to, you know, go off and work in an office all day long, or work in a store all day long. Usually when people answer that question, they answer it with a kind of career. And we have this idea, and this is probably throughout Western culture, that um, all of us have something that we were meant to do that's important to us, and that's often called a vocation. And the word vocation really literally means voice of God, meaning that you've been called. And sometimes people will call it a calling. Um, and for people who can't quite make money at their vocation, they sometimes go off and make money, uh, you know, in mundane kind of jobs, but they have what is called an avocation. So you can think of vocation as career and avocation as hobby, but there's really more to it than that. It's a meaningful type of work that you do. So if, if your work is not meaningful, you know, the way you make money is not meaningful, then you might do make enough money so that you can go off and do what you really enjoy doing, what you really think is important, and not have to make money at it. And of course, capitalism and the way that our economy works uh, can make different demands on adults where, you know, on the one hand, they have to make money and they have to participate in the economy, and that's impossible to do sometimes with some sort, some kinds of um, vocations. Um, but it also, you also have that pressure that you ought to be thinking about what you were meant to be. So this can lead to a lot of sort of disconnect and uh, conflicting demands upon adults. So the last stage we call old age or sometimes retirement, though we're getting to old age and not retiring more often now. Um, there's a couple of things I want to mention about how old age has changed and 
the way we think about old age. One is that um, there is a difference in the way that we um, are are constructed in media now. That age, old age, is constructed in media. There's a good example of this um, when you think about the adult diapers, um, the Depends adult diapers. So adult diapers have been around for a long time because older people have become more incontinent with age. Um, but most of the time in the past, when the advertising was done, it was done in medical uh, catalogs and that kind of thing. And if you read the ad, it would tell you about the absorbency and how you know uh, how it reduces smell and all of these kind of functional kind of things. Um, we now have um, advertisements on nightly television that are for adult diapers that show people dancing and like all commercials kind of implying that uh, if you wear these diapers and go out dancing, you're going to you know, get laid tonight. So um, the idea behind this is, is uh, sort of an underlying, um, this will improve your sex life, which all advertising tries to tell you that if you buy their product, uh, you'll be more desirable. Um, <clears throat> but this is a very different view of old age. It, it's saying, okay, you've got, yes, you're going to have more physical problems as you grow older and so forth, but you can still live an active and engaged life. Where in the past, when we talked about old age, we saw it as uh, withdrawing from the social world so that you become you know, more and more shut in, less and less active, uh, and treated more or less as an invalid. <clears throat> and this is all well and good, and I mean, I think it's probably a positive. I don't think there's anybody who's saying, oh, we should tell people that they should just go away and not be part of the world. But sociologists have also taken a look at how this can be detrimental to people who are experiencing more and more disability and more and more problems as they age. There's kind of a pressure to hide that now and stigmatize that instead of recognizing that there is a decline in health. So it's a balancing act that we haven't quite figured out yet. And of course, the profit motive is in the middle of it, so that makes it um, somewhat difficult to have that conversation sometimes. The other thing I want to mention is that uh, one of the things that we're facing in this country is um, that the population itself is getting older. The reason it's getting older is that we're having less children and we're living longer. And this is going to bring some problems in the future. One of the problems that gets talked about a lot is Social Security because um, every day until 2030, 10,000 more people are going to be eligible for Social Security. Um, as the baby boomer generation grows older, um, and they're living longer, so they're going to be needing that Social Security support much longer. And you don't have as many young people coming up. Uh, there are some people arguing that'll be okay because we have more machines and so forth. But there is one uh, part of this, um, and that is what's going to happen um, with housing. Housing is going to be a bigger and bigger deal because our houses are not built to be accessible in most parts of the country. And um, there's this concept called aging in place that uh, AARP and uh, gerontologists have talked about where we need houses that make it easier for people to get in and out of if they have to use an assistive device like a wheelchair or a scooter or a, um, a walker or a cane. And then we also need to have, uh, you know, wider rooms, wider hallways, wider doorways, and so forth to make sure that people can use those devices once they're inside the house. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because it will cost a lot more money to put people who can't get in and out of their homes uh, into special places like rest homes and assisted living places and so forth. So 
uh, we're probably going to have a pretty bad housing crisis within the next 10 or 15 years. And we already are seeing some communities that are beginning to address this, but um, it isn't as widespread as it should be, and it will create more problems because the longer you can keep somebody in their house, even if they're getting some sort of assistance to be in there, it is much, much less expensive than putting them in a home. And most of the time, that burden of putting them in a nursing home or putting them in a assisted living falls upon the taxpayer to pay for that because it's paid for through Medicare and Medicaid. So you're going to see a lot more you know, gerontologists and aging researchers are looking at this uh, as an important aspect of uh, where we're going with aging. And it's one that's not been talked about very much in the past. Also contributing to this is you're going to have more people aging who do not have children to help take care of them because we have fewer and fewer couples who have one or more kids. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But those sort of factors are coming together to create a kind of crisis as uh, we face retirement and old age, um, and as the population, the average age of the population grows older. So when we talk about the life course, I want to mention you know this idea of life chances. And the reason I want to mention it is because oftentimes what your life chances affect how you go through the life course. Like your childhood is going to be much different if you're poorer than if you're richer, or your adulthood is going to be much different, or your retirement is going to be much different, uh, depending upon whether or not you have barriers that, uh, that make it difficult for you to fulfill whatever potential you have. Uh, life chances sounds kind of like potential, but it's not really um, uh, just the concept of potential. Potential sort of psychologically suggests you know, that that's internal. So we use the word life chances because we're looking at sort of external things that prevent uh, people from, um, uh, from getting what they need and uh, living up to what they can't do. Uh, each culture has an idea about aging, and um, that means that they have different definitions of what childhood is, what adulthood is, what independence is, what uh, old age is, and so forth. And of course, those cultural differences will affect um, how uh, your life chances will work out. Of course, there are rites of passage that uh, every culture has. Uh, some of them are very specific, and um, some of them are sort of implied in what you do. <clears throat> And we need to understand that individuals may or may not follow those courses. They may not go through those rites of passages. They may not age in the same way. They may, uh, you know, take on adult responsibilities sooner than most people do or later than most people do, you know, depending upon what's going on with them. Um, but one of the factors that shapes whether or not individuals follow this uh, idea of how to age well is that there are inequalities that create barriers, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about life chances. Life chances means that in a just society, people should have an equal opportunity, and in most societies, we do not. And if we do not have equal opportunities, we will not age and create families in the same way. So, Going to the idea of um, looking at families, I want to go over some terminology so that you can understand the difference uh, when we do family research. One is that a household is different from a family. Household includes all the persons who occupy a housing unit as their usual place of residence. So this can include roommates, uh, you know, and it can include uh, temporary people who are coming and going and so forth. Um, you know, and, and there are people who are not officially a family because they do not uh, marry and get a, a state uh, license in order to be, but they still kind of occupy a household together. 
So there are all sorts of ways, and of course, individuals can become a household simply by living by themselves. So there's all sorts of ways that people live with each other, and any way that they live with each other is considered a household if they're in the same place of residence. A housing unit is the place where they live, a house, an apartment, a mobile home, a group of rooms, a single room, any of that kind of stuff. Anything that's intended for occupancy and somebody lives there is a housing unit. Families, on the other hand, are people who are related to each other, either by blood or by law, and a family may or may not live in the same household. So families and households get, you know, interchanged sometimes in uh, popular discourse, but for our purposes, we have very distinct definitions that are not the same. A household is about the housing unit, the usual place, of residence and families are about these legal and blood relationships that people have with each other. So let's talk about what types of families exist. So everybody knows the nuclear family and of course most people, politicians, people in public discourse talk about the nuclear family as if it has been here forever, that this is exactly, you know, that. Um, this is where all societies have been built and so forth. But the truth of the matter is uh, a husband, wife, and children living together in a single housing unit, making up a household, which is essentially what a nuclear family is suggesting, has really not been a predominant form of household for more than like 50 or 60 years. Uh, before uh, World War II, we had something called the extended family. And this is how most people live. And if you want to be truthful, um, when we talk about the way society has been built in the United States, it was not built uh, because of the nuclear family. It was built because of the extended family. The extended families, of course, are multi-generational, more than just two generations. So you have grandparents, great-grandparents, and living in the same household as parents and children. Now you also have cousins and brothers and sisters that are adults who bring in their families and so forth. So an extended family can mean any set of relations that um, are grouping themselves together either because they live in the same household or they live in the same vicinity of each other. Uh, a lot of times in cities, extended families would live you know, in the same apartment complex right, or, or high-rise building. And um, so they would be near each other and uh, would interact with each other. And people, um, you know, knew who their cousins were and hung out with their cousins often. And of course, the extended family is still important in a lot of subcultures in the United States. Um, one of the culture shocks of moving to Las Vegas was seeing Latino families that would um, have the entire family come to uh, a grocery store or to do shopping or whatever. And um, you didn't see that where I grew up in Florida. Most of the time when people went out shopping, they went out shopping as individuals or just adults. You know, like mom might have one of the kids with her kind of thing, but it wouldn't be husband, wife, and children all going into a place um, in, into the line at the grocery store and so forth. So obviously extended families and um, the way people do families can be very different uh, depending upon the subculture. Uh, where my family history comes from in um, West Virginia, my father's side of the family, um, I did, when I did my research in North Carolina, one of the things the nurses talked about was that when um, people from West Virginia came down to go to the hospital in uh, Northern North Carolina, um, instead of just a couple of people from the family coming by and visiting the patient, if the patient was in the hospital for more than a night or two, there would be an extended family that would show up and want to wait out until the person got better. And so they would often have to accommodate for 10 or 15 people 
um, because they all had come down to make sure that grandma or uncle or whoever uh, was uh, going to get better. Um, and of course, this is not what um, mainstream, this is not the way that mainstream America would necessarily um, do with a hospital visit most of the time. Uh, in mainstream America, it's only one significant person who comes and stays at a hospital when somebody's ill, and maybe not even that one. Maybe they just come and visit a little bit and come back. Um, so again, extended families have historically been important, but they all also remain important for a number of subcultures within the United States. Closely related to that, but sort of a new idea, uh, especially since the late 1970s and early 1980s when no-fault divorce became the way of the land so that people uh, found divorce easier to do is we have what is called blended families. And blended families are basically when a uh, husband and wife have children and then they divorce and they go marry other people who have children. You have stepbrothers and sisters. You have half-brothers and sisters and so forth. Some of the children may live in one of the households for part of the year and in a different household for another part of the year. And there may be weekends in one household and weekdays in another. So this is a new way of doing family because these people are related to each other legally and by blood because of the children that they shared and so forth. And for a while, there was not a lot of norms to, to turn to to tell you what to do when there was a blended family. And so there, you know, uh, even in legal cases, it was hard to figure out exactly what would be the best course of action if, um, if you are faced with um, having to deal with stepchildren and, and ha uh, half brothers and sisters, that kind of thing. Now, you know, it's been about 40 years, and we now start having some norms. Like, for instance, in court situations, the norm now is to try to, to go for joint custody in which both uh, divorcing parents have some responsibilities and rights in relationship to that child, and that's now considered an ideal and the best way to do it. And then if there is some challenge to that, that's where the burden of proof lies. Um, and then, of course, people have gotten better about it, you know, caring about what the kid needs, um, the kids need in those situations. And so there are a lot of self-help books. Self-help books are a good way to figure out how, what norms are being developed because that's essentially ways of training people how to deal with new things in their lives that they've not dealt with before. So the blended family is becoming much more prominent. Divorce is easier than it's been in the past, even with children. Child custody and um, child uh, care has become more um, uh, standardized and normalized. And so blended families are now very much a part of our society. And people don't think much about it anymore. It's not, you know. It's not shocking and it's not uh, hard to overwhelm. It's just a matter of working your way through it. And there are lots of ways that will support you working your way through that. There's one other kind of family that I want to talk about, which is not really necessarily related to a household, but it certainly generates a feeling of family for a lot of people. And this is something called fictive kin. Now, fictive kin has a, um, a very specific idea behind it, and that's something called general exchange. So a group of people who think of themselves as family, even though they don't have blood or legal relationships with each other, we, we know that they're fictive kin because they, they instead of exchanging goods and services on a one-to-one -one basis, so I babysit for you, and then you babysit for me, okay, so we have this exchange, that's called a specific exchange, but a general exchange would be that this, say there's five people in the group and one of them babysits and the other one um, does the laundry and the other one does the carpooling and they don't necessarily have to exchange with each other as long as they're giving something to the group 
they can expect something back from anybody in the group. It doesn't necessarily have to be the person that they gave um, the uh, service to or the resources to. So essentially, it becomes a group that is bonded together because people exchange things back and forth within the group, demonstrating that they are part of the group. Um, a couple of examples of fictive kin. Uh, one example would be street gangs. Um, and this is an important thing for criminologists especially to understand because, you know, most of the time when you have people who commit crimes together, and by the way, I'm not implying that all street gangs or gangs are criminal. There are a lot of people who get together into kind of um, uh, young people uh, having general exchange with each other and creating what we might call a gang who do not necessarily go out and commit crimes. But looking at the specific criminal gang, uh, because they are mostly a fictive kin group instead of a um, bound by, you know, a criminal group, um, the rules are kind of different. Uh, if you have, you know, two or three people who get together and say, we're going to go rob people and they go and do it, and you arrest one of them, it's very easy to say, okay, if you tell us about the other two, then we'll, you know, we'll let you have an easier sentence. And you can turn them and get them to give evidence and, you know, go after the, the group that way. But with uh, gangs that have fictive kin relationships, that's never going to work. This is why oftentimes, um, the only way to break up these kind of operations is to essentially go undercover because any other way you're not going to, you know, there's too much of a sense of we're in this together. We belong to each other to get them to turn on each other. That would be not just a, uh, a betrayal of the particular people that they might give evidence on, but it would be a betrayal to the entire group and it would be considered, um, uh, betraying somebody, betraying a group that you belong to. Uh, another example of fictive kin is, uh, is traditional black churches in the South, which very often have uh, created general exchange systems that have supported uh, all of the people who are involved in that church. I mean, you can look at the civil rights movement as uh, being born out of this fictive kin System because a lot of the early, uh, well, I don't want to say early, early because there were a lot of civil rights before the 1950s, but a lot of what we think of as the civil rights movement in the 1950s, including Rosa Parks, was born out of the ways in which black churches generated a fictive kin relationship among the people in the church. So it was very easy to organize them into political action because they were already organized. Uh, in a fictive kin relationship. So one of the ways that sociologists uh, study marriages and families is to collect data on them, and specifically to look at trends. And um, I've put on your canvas, uh, shell a copy of the American Families and Living Arrangements from 2012 and the U.S. Census Bureau uh, which is published by the U.S. Census Bureau in August of 2013. The 2012 data really is the latest data, and this is 2018 as I record this lecture, um, that I can get a hold of right now. I'm sure that these figures are going to change, and we're probably going to see a, a report like this within the next couple of years that we'll draw upon. But for right now, this is, uh, this is the data that we have coming out of the Census Bureau and taking a look at living arrangements. Um, and one of the things, if you look at this, so um, first of all, you can see that between 1970 and 2012, there have been a lot of changes in, the, in households and in family arrangements. Uh, in 1970, 81% of all households were family households, meaning everybody that was in the household was related to each other either by law or by blood. That's gone down to 66%. Um, Married couples with children under age 18 in 1970, 40% of all households were that arrangement. 
Now it's down to 20%. Now the reason it's down to 20% can be single parent, or it could be um, that uh, the people who are living with the children are not married, or it could be that uh, there is something other than um, a parent living with the children under 18, because a lot of grandparents and aunts and uncles, foster parents and so forth. But that still is significant that it's gone down, it's been halved since 1970. Um, also, the proportion of one person households has increased by 10 points, going from 17% to 27% of all households now have just one person in them. And the number of people per household, which you know is related to the fact that there's a lot of more one person households, has gone down from 3.1 to 2.6. So the one thing that I want to point out here is that most of the time when we think of family, and when we think of a household, we see in our heads a, a married, heterosexually married couple with children under the age of 18, but that really is only 20% of the households. So that's not typical, right? This stereotype that we have in our head is not actually the typical household in the United States. Uh, we don't have a single household type of household that we could call typical. We have a lot of different ways in which people live together. And so that's an interesting disconnect between the way people think about what a household is, and that gets reflected sometimes in the way that um, our tax laws talk about it, our politicians talk about it, and so forth, and the way that we actually live with each other. The way we live with each other is different. So if you're living alone or you don't have children, uh, you might consider the status sort of comforting that you are nowhere near like an outlier. Um, there are plenty of people who are living in similar arrangements to the way that you're living. And then finally, I want to mention that there is a, a huge variation in the way in which um, people marry nowadays. This is very different than it was in the past, and if you look, this is a Pew Research uh, graphic that is telling us that in some of the places in the United States, and you'll see the little red circle shows that um, uh, Southern Nevada and Las Vegas is definitely one of these, that um, people report, this is people reporting um, intermarriage, meaning they marry somebody with a different race or ethnic background than their own, uh, is, uh, is making up quite a few of the households. 25% of all newlyweds uh, in our area, or 25% or more, are marrying somebody of a different racial background. Um, this probably includes more uh, Hispanic and non-Hispanic than any other group together, but it certainly includes all different kinds of, of, of arrangements. So this is what we call exogeny, and I've mentioned in class uh, and in other materials before that uh, exogeny is on the rise. And this shows you that it's not uniformly on the rise everywhere. But it's definitely, uh, we live in an area uh, where that um, it's definitely on the rise here. And of course, the fact that people come here and get married, I'm not sure uh, if this is a, anybody who gets married here or if this is households who are here. So we have to be a little bit careful about the data. It may be skewed to higher because people come here to get married, but they don't end up living here. But this is certainly a big change in the way that people do marriage. It's not that many years ago. I mean, I think the last laws that uh, changed were in the 1960s and 70s that it was actually illegal to marry somebody of a different race in some states in this country. So this is definitely, you know, going from uh, you can't do it to 25% or more of you are doing it is a, a big shift in the way that we do marriage. 